Your attention, please. Paul and Alex are required to proceed to the gate immediately. What? No way. What is happening here? This is the last call for the Layovers podcast. Really? Come on, man. This is our thing. We got this. Oh, yeah. And we made it. Of course, geeks. Flight 59 to Manila. Welcome back to Europe, Alex. Thank you, sir. I, I feel like I haven't been here at all in the last summer. I assume that it was gloriously sunny for the two months that I was gone. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know London. June was amazing. July apparently was superb. And of course, the month where I was mostly in, which is August, which was just over, we recording today, September 6th, was dire. It was November. So, you know, you didn't miss anything then. Oh, well, good. I don't feel so bad then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. As if you were feeling bad. Bad at any time, anyway. <laughs> uh, so uh, to start with, I mean, we've been doing Asia because of me. I'll go to a lot of stuff about Asia again in this episode. But first, how was your trip back? Fine. Yeah, generally it was it was fine. I love flying out of San Jose, California, for one reason uh, because. Not only is it a very easy airport, and we've covered it in the past uh, in past episodes. I think we actually dedicated a whole episode to it. But when you take off, you do basically a tour of the Bay Area because you're you need to do a circuit of the airfield to get altitude to get away from the departing and landing traffic from San Francisco and Oakland. And it takes off at dusk, so you do this beautiful tour, and then you head out right past my hometown. So that's great, but. San Jose is one of the routes that is affected by this seemingly never-ending, what do they call it, mixed fleet cruise strike that oh, BA, BA is going yep. on. So as we experienced going over there, we uh, had a very, very limited crew complement for this flight back. And it did show my poor wife's seat was covered in... Uh, Bodily fluid? Is oh my god, no way. Fluid? Yeah, it was um it was puke and <laughs> And and my really? wife very very politely. I mean, she's she is American, but she's certainly taken on this, the British, you know, politeness and didn't really want to complain until I said you really have to. And the flight attendant comes by and says, "No, no, no, that's that's chicken curry." Like that <laughs> somehow made it better. Like, yeah, exactly. oh, it's just chicken curry. That's fine. No, wor- oh, that's fine. Uh, and so, God. and my wife is, is pregnant, so she's, um, easily nauseated. And so the sight of, and it, it was what she thought it was. It was definitely not chicken curry. So that was a little bit gross, but I had an interesting experience and I'm, I'm actually a little amazed that I haven't had this happen to me before. And I'm interested to hear if you've had this happen to you before as well. We flew, um, let's see, it was, like I said, takes off at eight. So it's predominantly a night flight, but at this time of year, the sun comes up reasonably early. So... About four hours into the flight, the beautiful window shades were activated because on a Dreamliner, they're not physical shades. They're these uh, this wonderful dimmable window, which is such a great feature. And, you know, because everybody wanted to go to sleep and the cabin lights were dimmed and, you know, and all of that. But this was uh, just at the tail end of the is it a Perseid meteor shower. I think it's the Perseid meteor shower that happens in August. And we caught some in California and I thought this is perfect conditions. I'm on the side away from the full moon. I ought to get a beautiful view. I'll just open up my window shade because it's pitch black outside. I'm going to get an amazing view. Everybody else was sleeping. Click, 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 click. (laughs) Locked. And I was like, okay, uh, this is weird. This didn't this shouldn't happen. Uh, this The whole point of these is that you can open and close them. So I, I went back to the galley. It was not a very busy flight. And I said, hey, I'd like to open up my window. I can't seem to do it. Is it broken? Oh, no, we've locked them because it'll be daylight soon, which was not true. And she knew that I knew that that wasn't true. It was going to be daylight in about five hours. And I explained why I wanted to. No, it's locked. The whole plane is locked and we can't change it because other people will open it. I'm like, I also know that's not true. I know that you can deactivate my seat. I can even show you how to do it. <laughs> and, the, and they're like, oh, well, let me talk to the cabin service manager and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like 45 minutes later, they said, okay, we've unlocked your window. And sure enough, they had. But I just thought it was a very strange thing to do. I've never experienced it being fully locked, that function of not being able to open it at all in any airline that has the Dreamliner. Have you ever had that before? 
No, uh, the few times I flew to Dreamliner for night flights, uh, I remember being able to open it, to undim it. Mm. I think, though I'm not certain, I think that on one, I'm trying to remember, was it maybe Qatar? I think it was not undimmable until the end, but I could still have like somehow less dim, like less black. That's, but but I, yeah. I don't recall having it fully locked, no. Or maybe I was just sleeping. I think there has been functions where you could dim it halfway or undim it halfway, but this was locked to the darkest mode, which completely makes the whole thing pointless. I know that they can override it. I know that's a function that a lot of the flight crews like, but it just seemed... It was irritating to me, not just that it was done, but the the way that my request was, was dealt with, like I was some petty irritation. <laughs> um, and I knew, you know, I would I would have absolutely closed the window blind or dimmed it, I guess, in this instance, uh, as we got closer to sunrise, because I get it. But of course, by that point, they'd unlocked it because we were three hours out and they wanted to wake everybody up to give them breakfast. So the entire thing was an exercise in futility. So yeah, again, BA go working hard to become the most mediocre airline on the planet. You are petty, actually. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Little things like that just drive me cuckoo bananas. I, I really do. <laughs> it's funny because we had a... So so we had a lot of uh, questions coming over, actually, mostly from Facebook, and we don't always have the time to address them. So I, I want to be to apologize to listeners. But it's exactly a question that Stanley uh, Pignall asked us almost uh, a month ago now. And he had a very similar experience than you. And he, so he was flying from, let me check, uh, it was Air Canada, Dreamliner as well, Toronto to Mumbai, leaving at 9.30, uh, landing on, at uh, 9.30, so both nighttime. And he, he's basically asking not exactly about that locking thing, but he's wondering why are these airlines treating the entire flight, which that, that's a very long flight, right, uh, mm. as a nighttime flight? Have you ever seen an airline that actually manages nighttime differently? Because most of the airline I've, I've, I've flown with, basically they shut everything down and they open it like a, two or three hours before the landing. There's no yeah. lights trying to manage. I think it's just because it's easier, right? And maybe that also explains your, uh, I don't know if it's laziness, but it's just easier to say, you know what, it's night for everyone, we'll have less work. And I'm not saying that they're lazy, they don't want to work, but I mean, yeah. people will just be asleep or watching a movie there's uh, no commotion, no people are like, say, I want to sleep and this other guy is actually talking or I want to sleep and this other guy is actually opening the blinds in the middle of the flight, which yeah. happened to me once. You know, it was Emirates went in the middle, so they don't, if, of course, they don't have Dreamliner, so it's a normal, you know, window shade. And they have this kid and I, have, I mean, I get it, the kid couldn't sleep and was trying to open the blinds, but it was like full daylight at that point yeah. of the flight. And then suddenly you're like, oh my God, right? And uh, I, I, again, nothing against the kid, you know, he was enjoying and wanted to see the view, but I, I, I'm guessing all airlines pretty much decide to put the nighttime and then, well, for the Dreamliner, it makes it even easier because you can press one button and then everybody's nighttime by default. And that I get. I, I think it makes total sense with the combination of mood lighting and dimming the windows to set the tone and just say, okay, it's time to sleep. This, you know, also indicating that the service is done for now. That makes total sense. And I, I think it's a wonderful feature for the flight attendants to be able to press a button and all the windows dim. But locking them doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I know that on the Dreamliner, you can set it so that it can be undimmed to a point where it's not, you know, flooding the cabin with light, which I agree is an irritation. But... I think there's this wonderful middle ground, and that's exactly why Boeing designed them as they are. But to your earlier question, I, I don't know how they think about where the plane is in terms of its daytime or nighttime. Like, you get on a plane and sometimes they serve you a meal which seems entirely contradictory to where you're coming from and where you're going to. So I have no idea how they do that. Actually, it's very interesting because that was the, the, the follow-up to his question. Stanley is to say, how do they decide when they serve food, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm sure they are like some, maybe not research, but there is like some type of uh, logic to it, right? After a certain time, after takeoff, you eat and you know that the duration of the flight, so you have to take the passengers busy, but you want them also to have some sleep and etc, yeah. etc. So we should maybe at some point invite, I know we always say we should invite people, but we should invite someone who actually maybe even like plans that or uh, or is it maybe just a habit from our lines to do like uh, two hours after the takeoff and like maybe two hours before landing if it's a long enough flight to serve food? I don't know, but it's, it's, it's fascinating indeed because 
I don't think I've seen any airline doing it differently. Most, are, unless you, of course, you're in first class and you have on-demand food or whatever. But for, as for the rest, usually it's very set time and it's always kind of the same logic. You take off, you wait a little bit, you have a drink, you eat, you're supposed to sleep. Then they wake you up. But sometimes they do, even though I said I don't want to be woken up. Yeah. And they and, and they serve you another route of food and then you land. And no matter the length of the flight, whether I mean, of course a long flight, but it could be eight hours, or it could be fourteen, and it seems to be the logic to be honest i don't know either but in your case maybe it's just like we don't want to bother with it i'm not here accusatory of, of ba but we don't want to bother with it at least there won't be anyone trying to open the window blinds let's just put like the lock for everyone they're just going to sleep yeah. and we're going to be you know I, I don't know maybe that's just that it could well be uh, it could well be and i think on on flights like that where it's a is essentially a red eye you you know you take off in the evening and land I don't know, mid-afternoon or lunchtime or things like that. I suppose it makes a little bit more sense. But in the instances that you're referring to in the one-sided in the question, things like, you know, London to Hong Kong, certain flight, they leave in the evening and arrive in the evening. Correct. Like, do, you, do you serve dinner twice? Do you, <laughs> like, what do you do? And, and when are people supposed to be sleeping? If, if I don't want to sleep so that I arrive in the evening and I'm ready to go to sleep... You know, who who is determining I mean, what the yeah. schedule or the quote unquote day of the airplane or the flight is, I suppose. It'd yeah. be very interesting to ask those questions. Yeah, I will have to so I'm doing this huge spreadsheet <laughs> where I'm yeah. looking because I've been the whole month of August, which is quieter for work in Europe, as you know. I mean I still have a lot of work with other continents, but I've I've started like scanning all my passporting pass going ten years and I've like even logged which was the gate and which I was in and I didn't think about the food and I have one habit which is a silly stupid habit but it's kind of stuck with me I take one picture with my phone of every plate that, that gets in front of me so I, I must have a log of pretty much every single type of food I had in the past let's say maybe seven to eight years at least maybe more there must be on a cloud server somewhere so I should <laughs> simply go and log back there and see what kind of food depending on the time it seems to me that usually when it's after midnight and of course here we're talking mostly about ME3, you know, these, these flights that live like in the middle of, 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 of the night, they don't serve dinner. But from Hong Kong, for instance, uh, when I flew, whether it's uh, I flew recently Swiss, I flew BA, I flew Emirates, I flew uh, CX. No, I didn't flew that way. Uh, they serve, <laughs> it was always, always kind of late. So 11 ish, of course, they served dinner which I knew, which is why I prevented myself to have a dinner before, so I wanted to try actually the food from the plane. And they serve kind of breakfast, even the... I, I, I don't know. We should ask someone. But it's, we it's have to ask somebody, actually. because it, it is, now that the more we talk about it and the more we kind of find these anomalies where... No, even if you're, if you're going on the clock from the city that you departed from or the clock of the city that you're arriving in, or the clock of the city you're flying over at that moment, the, moment, the meal exactly. that they're serving... Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what do you do? I mean, of course, you're, you're, the food is imposed. You cannot say, oh, I want to have breakfast again, unless you're in first class in some airlines. But what do you do with your, with your watch? Do you set it when you arrive in the plane? Do you set it, do you keep it on the time of the city you left? Or do you already set it on the destination? What do you do? I, I, I don't do anything. I used to, because I have a digital watch that sets oh, yeah, itself. Well. But, but in the past... I would always, as soon as I got onto the plane, I would set it to the, the destination city's time. And I would also eat according to that city. Because I think that those two, are at, plus daylight and exercise, are the, the four weapons of beating jet lag. Yeah, that's what I do. That's a similar. I always uh, know what time it's in the city I'm landing to and I'm uh, eating accordingly. Sometimes we're even refusing food, saying, well, no, you know what? It's going to be like dinner like at 4 a.m. or it doesn't make any sense. I want to be... My, my trick is to try not to eat for eight hours before 8 a.m. in the destination city. Uh, to say, like, to have my body kind of like it's been the night and I'll be hungry when I land and not to be like full with like chicken satay at 4 a.m. or something. I, I right. try because sometimes <laughs> I'm bored and I still want to eat something. <laughs> but yeah. but the, for the watch I changed, so I don't have an Apple watch or any smartwatch uh, because, you know, I'm Swiss and I have to defend my old timey kind of watches, I guess. <laughs> I, used to be the guy, I used to be the guy who used to set his leave its watch 
to the origin point for a very long time, and I changed this habit about a year ago. Now I set it immediately when I, I, I sit in the plane to the destination, and I see it works well. The reason I started doing that is because, so, you know, if you have Wi-Fi uh, in the flight, you know, as, as a lot of people, your phone is your watch nowadays, right? My, my, yeah. my, my watch on my hand is more something like a jewelry or something. So be, yeah. But the thing is, when you log on to Wi-Fi, Certainly, sometimes my phone, of course, like adapts to the whatever time zone I'm currently in. So I get completely ah. thrown off. I'm like, it's 4 a.m., but it seemed to me I left it was 11. It's not only two hours ago. So I'd rather. That's so, an interesting point. Yeah. So basically, my watch on my hand, I know that this one, because it won't be disturbed by any kind of electronics, is the destination time. And I can always check how long do I have before I land. Uh, of course, now you have IFEs that have this feature, but sometimes, you know, when I'm asleep, I don't want to put the screen on because it's going to wake me up or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my... Uh, guys, by the way, if you have any techniques, <laughs> anyone, let us know. We tweets, should we message. yeah, we should spend some time talking about jet lag in an upcoming episode. Yeah, I'm absolutely. sure everybody has their own has their own strategy for dealing it. I think it's a definitely a worthwhile topic for exploration. So, uh, Asia, Manila, I'll go to the airport, of course, at the end of the show. Uh, I used to live there, so I have a lot to say about an airport. It's not as convoluted as Narita in episode 50, but it is quite <laughs> convoluted as well. It was voted for a very long time one of the worst airports in the world. As he's Really? Long. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for a reason. I used to live there, and trust me, there are so many reasons why. Uh, though, again, these kind of things are always like... I have this friend of mine, I keep t- talking about Eric, my friend who's uh, in the United Nations and, you know, travels all around Africa and in these, like, he sends me pictures of these airports where there's one aircraft from the UN and says, okay, Paul, this is the worst airport in the world. I'm like, yeah, okay, granted, right? <laughs> it's really hard to decide what is yeah, the worst that's airport a little, in the world. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. He, he Although, gets to experience the, the, the more, uh, what is it, rustic airports of the world. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Charles de Gaulle actually qualifies. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there was a fascinating article in, uh, was it Bloomberg or the FT? It was Bloomberg talking about the, the dominance of Singapore and Hong Kong that was under threat. It's been going on for a while. And of course, when we think about that, the first thing we think about is obviously uh, Doha, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. But this article goes in the other direction and talks about the investments that are being made in Asia. Uh, and the, the investments in Asia are it's staggering, the amount of money they're spending. And it's like, it's really like a race between global hubs and these global hubs are mostly uh, the investment currently is mostly done in Asia and they say that the dominance of these two and arguably three because Incheon is also like one and they always voted you know the three biggest the three best airports in the world that now is being threatened by China especially they say here that a 12.9 billion dollar new airport in uh, Beijing Uh, you have Bangkok that is investing almost 4 billion we talked about this uh, airport in the last episode uh, almost four billion to uh, of upgrading and adding a third runway. So Incheon is is spending five billion dollars for a second terminal and and wants to be the world's leading mega hub airport. That's how they actually advertise it. So Shanghai has to react. So Shanghai is building you know this kind of thing in the middle. I saw it. It's still not ready. You know this kind of almost like what the bubble in the middle of all yeah. the terminals. <laughs> the terminals are staggered like uh, like um, you. You know there's one in front of you and two on the sides and like right yeah. in the middle. There's going to be this magnificent destination point. They've just opened T4, so I saw it from the outside. Uh, I didn't go inside, but it, it's apparently brilliant. It's more of a low cost, but they, they automated a lot of stuff. And it's uh, there's even, like I think, robots there or something. Wow. I don't know if it's a gimmick or if it's the truth, but it's uh, it's really it looks really cool. Uh, Hong Kong, we said Hong Kong is building a, a third runway. Uh, I think the cost is uh, 18 to $20 billion. <laughs> it's just like... Uh, it's just crazy. The the money that is being spent in Asia is more than almost like $130 billion. In the US and Canada, that number in, is $3.6 billion. So you see that kind of the width, the, the difference, how much money they are wow. investing. Where it's become interesting is, like I said uh, uh, earlier, is China. So China, of course, now is investing massively in its airport infrastructure and its travel infrastructure in general. We know about the high-speed trains as well. And all the big airlines there are building their mega airports. We haven't really heard about them yet unless you've been there. And of course, besides Shanghai 
and and Beijing mostly. But they are, uh, for instance, Shenzhen is, wants to build a cluster of airports uh, around Shenzhen. So there's already the very big Shenzhen one, but they want to be in a cluster. They, they're, they're directly threatening here Hong Kong. Uh, they want to do the same thing around Beijing. They, Beijing already has one big airport and I think a second one. Shanghai has already two airports. They want to also build clusters of airports. And it's really like... A lot of the, these airlines are raising, I mean, you know, I mean, probably right, right now we're still like, uh, you know, when I look at flights to go to Asia, I'm like, I, I can take China Easter, I can take Air China, I can take China Southern, but I still kind of default to the other airlines. Yeah. But maybe one day this is where we're going to commute, these big airports, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I've, trans- I've transited through Shanghai on Emirates and it was fine. Uh, it's not great. It's not a great experience. I think Hong Kong has built its reputation and the others, you know, uh, Singapore as well and KL to an extent uh, on that whole transit mechanism. So it's not just about the destination. They've 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 just nailed it. So the flow of passengers, the where aircraft park relative to terminals and gates and transport. I mean, transiting through Hong Kong is just a dream. There's a separate screening area for, uh, that dumps wow. you out just where you need to be in the international terminal. But the dilution, if you will, of, of, the, of transit traffic through Hong Kong is not just hurting Hong Kong, but it's also hurting Cathay in a big, big of way course. who have of posted – some really gnarly financial results in the last uh, couple of months. So I'm with you. I can't see myself deferring to some of those other airports just because geographically when you're bouncing around Asia, Hong Kong, and to an extent Singapore are are well positioned for both European and American transit traffic as well as, you know, other spots and Australia. Uh, so not just regionally as well, but as far from far field as, as Australia. So, but I know that it's something that's worried them. First, they have to worry about the Middle East uh, is stealing all this traffic. Now they're having to worry about other regional players, as you say, specifically China taking their uh, their dinner away from them. And I also think that what uh, the, the trend we're seeing is with this dream lighter that you just took, you can do more point to point traffic. And I, yeah. uh, so for instance, Hainan and Chengdu Airlines are both, uh, opening a lot of routes from uh, second, but even third tier Chinese cities. And when you say third tier Chinese cities, we're not talking about a village. Usually we're talking already like a megalopolis. Yeah, five five million people, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) So they're they're going to soon, because, you know, we know that travel from China will explode internationally at some point. They will simply bypass, uh, you know, Hong Kong, bypass Singapore, bypass Incheon. They will go directly from these, uh, from Guangzhou and other the o- other places like this, and Guangzhou is not a third uh, tier Chinese city, by the way, guys. Uh, they, so it's it's fascinating how these the amount of money they're spending in China is absolutely uh, staggering. Which is why, again, and I said it earlier that Hong Kong is has to react and actually is building. You know, is open just as the new concourse, the midfield one is actually expanding the third runway. They want to expand again uh, and kind of create a better passenger experience because for the for the moment, at least for my reminiscence, these hubs in China are not really well made for transit. They're made as a destination airport. I had to transit in Shanghai. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Pudong. And it, with China Easter, I think it was. And it, the experience was a bit strange, right? It was. Uh, it, it, it clearly wasn't something they were used to, to have a foreigner transiting in China to go to another foreign country. I was, I was transiting to, to Tokyo. So it's, it's not, we're not talking Dubai, we're not talking Singapore, we're not talking Incheon. These airports are not ready yet, but they will be. And uh, so that's fascinating. Just one last number, because I found it absolutely crazy staggering, the amount of money that's going to be spent on airports that is currently earmarked to building new airports is $250 billion. Wow. And the amount of money that is uh, earmarked already to be spent on upgrades and extra runways uh, and terminals is at $845 billion. We're going to see a lot of airports. We, we have a lot of shows to do, Alex. <laughs> yeah, we need to start bouncing around to some of these places that are really <laughs> going through this this renaissance of airport infrastructure. And I, But there's one point that I wanted to go back to that you made that I think is a the beginning of a trend that Qantas have announced that yeah. they're going to be flying from the east coast of Australia, so Melbourne and Sydney, to Heathrow nonstop yeah. with the yeah. with the triple seven X and the A three five nine 
ULR, ultra long range, <laughs> uh, which is 20 hours and 20 minutes with no need to stop in Singapore or Dubai or anywhere else. And also the same cities to New York. So it's just, uh, just an incredible flight time, but also, again, cutting out these places that have been utterly dependent on transitional traffic since their inception, really. Yeah, currently they're flying from Perth uh, to London. It's a Dreamliner, the Dash 9. So Sydney, they're announcing it's It's as if they're announcing it to basically set a message to both Boeing and Airbus to say, guys, we haven't chosen the plane yet, which will do that route, but you have to be ready. So currently, the, the, the 350 you just mentioned has, I think... Uh, a range that was recently increased because of them, it, uh, a range of 9,700 nautical miles. That's right? extraordinary. The Sydney, London is 9,600. It's just, just below that limit, which, wow. and that's, uh, we're talking including headwinds, right? So I think it's just not ready yet because if, you know, you cannot just afford yourself to say, oh, sorry, the headwinds were bad today. So we have to land in Rome <laughs> instead of London. Well, right? that's what happens on some of the transcons for in the US when they're using the A320s. You would have to stop in Salt Lake City and refuel. Yeah. Well, you're going the long way, New York or East Coast to West Coast. But that's but, the yeah, thing how think, pissed off would you be? Yeah, exactly. Which, which, and, and you know, they're taking somewhat of a risk. I mean, not somewhat of a risk, but I mean, uh, the, the, the Dash 9, for instance, you have 200, what, 240 passengers in, in it. In the 380 that they currently, uh, and we'll go there in a minute, the 380 they're currently, uh, using, they have only in economy like 370 passengers. Mm. So it's, it's, it, you have to say, okay, we're going to do a premium route because obviously that will attract mostly, I guess, business passengers that want to go directly to London without a, a, having to commute somewhere. Uh, it, it has to be financially viable to do a 20 hour flight. You know, and you, and as you say, you cannot just say to these business people, "Oh, sorry, we have to suddenly like land in Charles de Gaulle because we just ran out of fuel because of bad headwinds." So, I think it's just a message because they haven't announced a launch date, of course, of that route. They just are signaling it, and I'm sure that like you just mentioned, the triple seven X and Airbus will react to it and say, okay, we'll bid for that route. I said, this is the aircraft you will have to use. You have to buy our aircraft to being able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And the Qantas have said they want it done by 2022, which, as you say, is a is a message to the airplane aircraft manufacturers that, that, you know, this is our timeline, please meet it. And also the other very big news since you started about Qantas is that they are ditching Dubai. And uh, so the, for the 380, for the past five years, they've been routing through Dubai and having some kind of a very tight integration with uh, Emirates. They are ditching Dubai. They're going back to Singapore. <laughs> That's very yeah, interesting, I, I think. I was shocked when you sent me this news and I still can't figure it out. Like, has the relationship between Qantas and Emirates changed? I mean, because they were like... So when you searched on on Emirates for a flight to wherever, really, uh, especially from London to 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 Dubai, there was a good chance that you were going to be on on Qantas metal and vice versa. They were really tightly integrated. It was beyond a code share. And now this news that they're going to be for for flights at least to to London. I'm not sure about other European routes that they're going to be going via Singapore. I I. Did you get any any more about this? I mean, how did? What's the story? I don't know the backstory. My gut feeling is that um, you know, Emirates will still fly to Australia. They have tons of routes, and I think Qantas had to differentiate itself for the past five years. When they announced this integration, I mean, integration is code shares and somewhat of an integration with Emirates. They were not great financially. In the past five years, they've gone from not being great to making a lot of profit. A lot of Australians are not happy about the way the company is run. But at the end of the day, the company is making a lot of profit. And I think they don't, they don't feel strong enough to say, you know what, we're going to go on our own again. And, and there's a caveat to that. But we're going to go on our own again. And we know, apparently that's what they say, that their customers would prefer to uh, commute via Singapore. And also that they need a link, a bigger link to Asia. They know, again, the explosion we just mentioned earlier, the explosion of traffic is coming from Asia Pacific. So having there a hub in Singapore makes more sense to attract, to feed a lot of the travelers back to Australia, from Australia to even other airlines. Yeah. They're not, from what I'm hearing, they're not abandoning the the court shares uh, completely with uh, with Emirates. Apparently, you will still be able 
to uh, use your miles on both airlines. So it's not like, oh, bye-bye Emirates, we're not talking to you anymore. Uh, now, basically, Australians at least will have a choice. They can say, oh, I want to route through Singapore and fly Qantas, or I can route through Dubai and fly Emirates, which, again, I repeat, will still have tons of flights going. So... Maybe it's just that they feel confident enough to say, you know, now we're in a very good position. They probably need to differentiate because that's the thing. Why would you, I mean, unless you're Australian and you love Qantas and you have the love of the brand. Well, if it's exactly the same route than Emirates, Emirates, and we know that Emirates has a lot of money to basically beat Qantas every single time. You need to find a differentiator. Maybe that's just that. I don't know. Yeah, I I honestly don't know either. And I've always wondered why they why they went that route and not more through Hong Kong where they have their one world partner in Cathay flying five times a day to London or BA on a couple of couple of times a day, I think. Maybe that's exactly the reason because if you're one world and you live in Singapore, suddenly you have Qantas. Whereas yeah, all the, if you live true. in Hong Kong, you have all the other choices. I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. It's, it's interesting. And it's what they used to do traditionally. Uh, I mean, before five years ago, now a lot of people were shocked when they announced that they were ditching Singapore to go to Dubai. So they're going back to what their historical route was. And again, you could actually do like Melbourne or Sydney to Perth and then going Perth to London, right? And then you're not even thinking about Singapore or, or, or Dubai. So very, very interesting. They also, by the way, announced that they are uh, retrofitting the 3T with uh, the new business class. It's a, it's a Vantage XL. It's the same one that you have on Delta One, the same one that oh, I yeah. flew recently on, on SAS. It's a staggered one to one. Uh, South African, I think, has the same. Uh, and Philippines Airlines, they were talking to Manila today, has announced it. Uh, as I said earlier, I didn't want to fly a London to the Philippines with Philippines Airlines first because they're not part of an alliance, which I would not gain points for, but also because they have these very weird seats that I think the only airline that has in, in, in business where... So it's two, and when they go on lie flat, one seat overlaps on top of the other. What? So, yeah, I'm not kidding. So you have your fellow passenger that is approximately 80 centimeters, maybe to a meter higher than you on your side. And I don't know, you know, I don't even know how it works when you want to go off your seat. <laughs> it's very strange. That is bizarre. Yeah. I was thinking about just flying them just for the sake of trying that because that seems really bizarre. Uh, guys, just Google A330 Business Class Philippine Airlines uh, and Google image it and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. There's also probably some videos on YouTube. It is a very bizarre layout. It's like a bunk bed and I'm especially wondering how the person who's higher if she or he wants to go to the bathroom, does he or she have to step over the other passengers and using, you know, the other seat as a ladder, basically, to go down? I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> it is absolutely, completely uh, weird. So my trips to Manila, uh, I've done two. I said in the past episode I had one. one. I've done the second one now. The first one was... Uh, Uh, Heathrow, Hong Kong, Manila, Hong Kong, Gatwick. I flew uh, the main bits on uh, Emirates. Uh, So I flew, it's actually London, Dubai, Hong Kong, then Manila and Hong Kong, Dubai, uh, Gatwick. And the other the the Asian bits, if you want, were done with uh, Cathay Pacific. I so love Cathay Pacific. I was supposed to fly actually from, and I'll I'll ask you a question about that because I know you've been having a trouble today. (laughs) Um, I was supposed to fly uh, from Gatwick. But I get a, an SMS in, the, in that morning that say, oh, my flight will be delayed for operational reasons. And I'm like, okay. And uh, I, I really needed to catch the Cathay Pacific flight to get to Manila. And uh, at first I was like, okay, well, you know, one hour it was fine. Then they announced two hours. But then I check online and I, and I see a four-hour delay, which was not announced. So I call immediately Emirates and I'm like... Guys, so if I have a four-hour delay, I'm missing my connection in Dubai, I need to get in another flight to Hong Kong, which would have meant waiting for seven hours in Dubai, I'm missing my Cathay. They said, yeah, I said, okay, so can you change me? I was very proactive. Can you change me in the flight at least approximately at the same time for me throw? They said, we're going to call you back in 10 minutes. And in 10, you know, maybe 15 minutes I had, it was fantastic. The one thing that was really amazing, I mean, I know it's a little thing, but again, the little things matter, is that since they have my number, my mobile phone number on file, when I call the number, the customer care number, my number is recognized and says, oh, hi, you're a gold member. We're going to direct you go to the fast track of the customer right. service. That was that was pretty That's amazing. cool. You had an experience where you you are currently trying to change it and it's not working, right? Not with Emirates though. No. 
I, I just I sent Paul a message and it just said, "Dude," and, which <laughs> normally means that things aren't going to be good. I, I I feel like on this show I bitch a lot, but it, perhaps I need to make better airline choices like you do. I have to change the departure city of a flight that I'm taking. Uh, at what in two weeks from San Jose, California to L.A. And I was, you know, bracing myself for some fees and everything. And that's fine. You know, it is what it is. And so I uh, I called up the gold line on BA and I said, I need to, to make this change. I, and I've already flown the the outbound leg, which actually doesn't make that much of a difference. And she said, yep, that's I can. We, there's availability in your class. So that's no problem. Let me just let me just put you on hold. I'm going to recalculate the fees if there are changes and anything like that or difference in fare. Puts me on hold and she comes back. And says, uh, she says, yep, that's that's no problem. We can make that change. But it, because you've flown the outbound and there was an upgrade on that leg, uh, it needs to go to our fair team to make the change. And that'll take a few days. I'm like, <laughs> days? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she, say, she says, but don't worry. They usually do it in, in less than three days. And I was like this silence on the line. Then I just said again, Days? <laughs> And I said to my to my wife uh, when I was explaining to her that it looks like that BA have to fax the 20th century to change my reservation <laughs> in whatever handwritten ledger they log flights in. I cannot understand for the life of me how it can take three days, irrespective of the the fees. They need to send a raven, you know, with a little <laughs> with a message attached to the ING board. I guess. I mean, man, they, no, it, it they doesn't, just it doesn't change the reservation sense. systems to like to handle stuff like this. We keep scratching, yeah. The, I, uh, keep scratching. I just yeah, don't understand it. I got to stop flying VA because they keep letting me down. It's it's insane. It's insane. No, I, and, I, and then you come back and say twenty minutes. They called you back. They you know they asked how your family was doing and they remembered your birthday and like they t- they puke on my wife's seat at the end. Actually, you know, so parts of uh, parts of Emirates offering if in certain cities in the world, if you fly a uh, business class, that was paid. This was paid by a client. You have the chauffeur service. So you have basically uh, drivers coming to pick you up. It's a little thing because at the end of the day, you know, going to Heathrow from my place, uh, it's not a big deal. But I had already. Uh, a driver actually said to, to pick me up and go to Gatwick. The driver actually arrives, and I'm still calling Emirates. No, sorry, Emirates just had called me and the, dr- the, the driver. So we were really talking about, you know, because the driver comes like three hours before the flight. We were really talking like last minute. The driver arrives, and I, and I say, I said, oh, you're for Gatwick. And I said, no, I need to go to Heathrow. And he's like, oh, okay. And he makes one phone call that lasts 10 seconds. He's like, sir, I'm, I'm getting you to Heathrow. It was so seamless. That's, it was, it was, uh, oh, I love actually, it. Actually, you know, it was, you know, it worked. So uh, the flight itself, it was fun. I just, uh, just mentioned it. You know, Emirates has a few of their aircrafts with special liveries. This one was against illegal wildlife trade. It was like oh, the elephants. It was the model they have at the uh, the roundabout in Terminal Three at Heathrow. Exactly, is. that's the one I flew. That was really that was really cool. And interestingly, uh, you, I know you've flown also the three eighty in business class a few times since that. You know, the, the flight was really full, so I took kind of the last seat available, and it was an ale in the middle, so it was not you know like not a your window, which I usually seat. do. And to be honest with you, uh, there were uh, I realized that, that for the first time that there's not a lot of storage actually when you fly on an AL seat which doesn't have you know these side storage that you find on a 380 on the side. There's actually not a lot of storage. So of course you you just put stuff in the overhead. But uh, I bad point for Emirates. I always thought you know because they always fly like you window usually that there's like lots of place to put stuff. No, it's not the case actually. But I mean it was good. Then I uh, Dubai to Hong Kong was great. It was actually uh, it was so cool to hear that the, the the pilot was a was a woman. I think she was from Egypt, so that was that was really nice. And most of the, the crew that flight was 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 female. I really loved it. I had the bulkhead twenty three A. That's my favorite ah, nice. uh, seat of the three because it's a little bit more space for someone like me who's very tall. Interestingly, I just booked yesterday a flight again Emirates. I'm going to Bahrain, uh, so it's very close to actually to Dubai. And the system now, they've revamped, it's slightly upgraded the UX, the user experience on Emirates websites, automatically chose seats that I usually chose. So it actually gave me 24 A, and I was like, really? And he also knew that on the 777, I like to be six or seven, which are the rows in the small cabin just behind first class and not the bigger cabin behind. It was like, that can't be 
that they just assigned them randomly by accident. Yeah, no, they just they looked at my past history of choosing seats and they chose the one I like, which is really really cool. I, I should That's ask someone. So cool. Yeah, I don't know if I get it cannot be an accident. Anyway, then I flew uh, Cathay Pacific. It was a very old triple seven. Again, the the these you know weird power thing that they have. This uh, round, yeah. I don't know. We don't know M the name. Power. Of it. What was really cool, he says, one passenger. So, of course, I didn't have, I have actually at home one adapter that I never take, obviously, because you don't see these, uh, these power outlets uh, anymore. But so one passenger wanted to plug his uh, laptop, or was it a phone? I don't remember. They actually have a huge fat, looks like a Bible, you know, like it, it's an adapter. So there's a cable that goes to that, uh, to that plug. Then you have this big fat electric adapter on which you have an US plug. So the guy had this, which was already used on his lap, plus an adapter for to go to, I guess, to British plugs. Plus on top the actual, you know, uh, adapter to charge his phone or laptop. So he has these massive, but they have them. So guys, if you ever fly Cathay Pacific and they have these very old power th systems, they actually do have massive transformers adapters that you can use. Jeez. I didn't ask for one, but I mean, it's, uh, well, it's fun. <laughs> I don't know what the schedule is for the retirement of those 777s, but Cathay were among the first airline to get the 777 when it launched Correct. in 1990. So some of those are 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 getting on in age. Same with BA, some of those things are, and I have the pleasure of flying on one later on this month that are getting a little long in the tooth. So I, I think Cathay have announced they're gonna be retiring those pretty aggressively, but they are the workhorses currently of the Cathay fleet. And, you know, having lived in Manila and travel there usually because it's not a premium destination sorry all my Filipino friends airlines tend to put their older fleet to that line uh, which is great for me because I can test a lot of these old airlines I yeah. saying saying that on the way back I had the 350 from uh, Cathay Pacific so it's not only the case in the 350 oh, wow. of course it's wonderful you know it's yeah. absolutely wonderful uh, aircraft um, a few things here before I go uh, continue I've seen in uh, Dubai an increase in security. I don't know. Again, I was not going to the U.S., but I'm wondering if all these things we're hearing is actually... I had, for the first time, to again remove my shoes to do extra measures that I didn't have to in the past. I've seen mm. the same thing in Singapore where I flew my second leg. Uh, I'll talk about it later in the show. I also seen the same increase in security in Manila Airport. Uh, maybe not in Hong Kong, I'm not sure, but Dubai, so I don't know. I mean, you've flown mostly from the US, in the US recently, but pay attention to that in your next flight if you, I don't know if it's just a feeling, it no, you're right. Like you you are absolutely right because when we when we arrived from Marseille yesterday, they made a point of announcing that if you are transiting to a U.S. flight, there are increased security measures in place, and it's going to take a lot a lot longer than it did. And I know that they've changed the protocol in the U.S. Not so much in San Jose, but certainly in San Francisco. So I think things are definitely in flux at the moment. So I returned to Gatwick because I needed to catch a train from Gatwick to Leicester, uh, again with Emirates. One thing uh, only that I will say about this, it was my first time in the two-class 380, so there's no first class. So they replaced on the upper deck in the front where uh, first class used to be, they replaced it with economy. So you have a possibility if you're flying economy with Emirates with those 380s, there are not that many yet, to fly on the upper deck, which is really cool. But one really, really, really cool thing that I didn't think about until I actually deplaned in Gatwick. Usually Emirates, of course, because they want to satisfy their premium passengers, they will leave out in that order, first the people in first class, then they will let people out from uh, business class, and then economy. If you're on a 380, usually, since all economy is downstairs, uh, you go basically, they go at the same time in two different uh, jet bridges. Because people in economy were in the front and the door is there, and that's a trick if you want to fly with this and you want to deplane first, if you fly economy upper deck on a 380 with Emirates, you're going to be the first ones out of the plane, ah. even before business class. That's really cool if you want if you're in a hurry and you don't want to spend money. So fly upper deck. <laughs> fly upper when deck. You, when you came in, I think that's 
there's only a couple of uh, gates at Gatwick that can take the 380. But were you at that remote pier where you had to go up over yep. the yep. the sky? That's yep. so cool. I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a long. It's a walk. long walk. Oh yeah. Uh, by the way, they say that it's cool because if you have, I don't have, but if you have checked in luggage with Gatwick being less of a business airport, by the time you reach the belt, your luggage is already there because you walked a little bit more. True. So you actually, you don't seem to be waiting forever for your luggage to arrive, which is actually pretty sensible. But it's, yeah. it's a long walk. You you had a did you did you fly Gatwick recently or did I? Yes, maybe. Yes, <laughs> I did. I did. I flew to Rome uh, from Gatwick on BA and back on EasyJet. How was the passport control? Passport control was fine because of the e gates. Um, oh yeah, Gatwick is fine for that generally. I've found, but. Heathrow, Heathrow, I can see. Oh yeah, when we came God. in last night, was a was a, a total disaster. I like, you know, Gatwick is a great airport. Almost always, it just seems to work. I like it. They've worked hard to to really uh, agree. Do do with do what they can with what they have, given that they were they were not uh, given permission to expand their their runways. So I like I like. It. I stayed in the Block Hotel, which is right inside <laughs> yeah. the South Terminal. Yeah. So I could like. You know, get up 20 minutes before my flight left and still have plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still do not think it's really a business airport. No, it's but definitely I not. I do agree that it's a very seamless airport. And, uh, the, and and I had no problem with passport control. And exactly like you, actually, returning on my second flight, I'll go in a, in a minute about it. I was at Ethro T Terminal 2. Uh, so I learned because I called out at some point, uh, I think called out Ethro on it. I said, come on, the E-gates are not working. They're never working. They were like 15 E-gates and yeah. two were actually open and there was ah. a, a queue. They answer me, so we have an, our, our answer there. They say that for a set of five E-gates, you need one border control officer. So if you have only one person, even though they have massive number of e-gates, it can only open five. The thing is, only two were open, and I could see three, actually, officers. But I could also see a lot of consultants who were, they looked very serious and very at all the, the doors, and there was clearly an issue. So I'm still thinking that Ethro maybe might not have chosen the best provider for these no. e-gates because they keep having issues. We're in, Wherever when I'm in every other country, Rome, and you, maybe you'll, you can tell us about how was Rome, but Amazing. it just works. Uh, how it was does. Rome, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. And I think uh, it definitely, even after what is it, 10 years, it needs massaging. Rome, as exactly as you said it was, perfect. We were in Terminal 3, which is the yep. recently re renovated one. A everything, just just the silly things like, yes, the, not what's well, not silly, it's very important, but the, the E-gates were snappy and fast and no problems at all. And, and when you're going through just then this is a silly thing. When you're going through security, which again was fast and seamless and polite and easy, you take your tray, uh, it comes up on a on a little conveyor belt, you put it through, and then it goes automatically back, the empty one, back down into the conveyor yeah, belt. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you don't have to pick it up and put it into a thing, which then does it. It just slides straight into the... It's just... I was so impressed by that terminal. So impressed by that terminal. Have you seen the new parts of it? I don't know. I think uh, it was my first experience at Rome, and everything looked brand new. I was yeah, yeah, that's so impressed the, with it. The, yeah, that's the new part. That's the new part. We'll redo Rome one day as an airport and talk about it, because uh, I was very happy to have seen this evolution. Before we continue with my, my second flight, Emirates, have you seen that story that was caught by a lot of news outlet from a passenger that recorded uh, a flight attendant putting champagne back into the bottle. Oh, yeah. Yes. A lot of people have mentioned that to me. It's uh, what? <laughs> very embarrassing. I will say two things. First, yeah, some people say, yeah, look, Emirates is cost-cutting. They're very being cheap. They are using champagne. Maybe. I, honestly, I don't know. I, I doubt it, but I don't know. Maybe I doubt it because they've, they've they locked me in as a good customer and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm fond of them. But when you are about to land and you need to clean stuff, you need to put all the bottles and everything back into place in the secure manner. And I'm wondering if that uh, video might have not been taken at the last bit of the flight when they have to basically, either you go and you put everything in a toilet or you simply put, and it was maybe not meant to be served again, simply meant to be safely stored for that's landing. That's a great point. I bet you that's what it is. Yeah, that's the only thing I'm thinking because a lot of people were immediately going calling out and maybe that was the case. But honestly, I just think that the person misunderstood that liquids and everything have to be like stored safely when you are about to land again. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I hadn't even thought about that, but it just seemed that since we hadn't heard so much, anyone else post anything about this in the past, that if this was company policy, that we would have heard a lot more about it. So I think I think that explanation seems to be the most logical so back, because if we don't want to do one hour and a half in every episode now, even though Alex has a lot of flights coming up in September and we'll have another <laughs> hard time. He's, 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 he's experiencing my July, actually, in September. He's yes. off for the pretty much the entire month, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is great. We've got a lot of new airports to talk about. My Manila uh, flight, my second one, I did uh, this time. Zero, uh, it's First of all, it was really amazing because I was looking at on Matrix, on Skyscanner, and Google Flights everywhere to find a good deal to go to Manila again. And... Uh, the best deal I found in actually on the Swiss website, which offered me a route from uh, London to Zurich, Zurich to Singapore with Singapore Airlines. I had to spend actually a night in Singapore because I needed to for work. Then uh, I did Singapore to uh, Manila and on the way back, Cathay Pacific to Hong Kong and then Hong Kong to Zurich with Swiss, the new 777-300ER, and then back with a 320 to uh, uh, London with Swiss again. The one thing that was funny in London, we had a delay to Zurich and a lot of people are starting complaining. You know how it goes. People at the gate like, I don't know what's going on. You know, even though people in the UK are less vocal probably than <laughs> other countries, but they were complaining. And as soon as we sat down, the pilot came on the, the PA and said, the first officer fell violently ill after eating his breakfast, which was literally an hour before the flight. And we had to find a replacement. Uh. <laughs> and then I could see that all the people that were, used to, that were complaining at the door were suddenly, oh, okay, I'm not saying anything. I'm so sorry. Uh, which also tells you that when you fly an airline which base is not London, for in that sense, Swiss, of course, it's harder to find a replacement, but they were able. We only had a 40-minute delay. So then Singapore with a 380 from, uh, from Zurich. You know, it's always in my heart. I always have like, what is the best airline? Is it Singapore Airlines or is it Cathay Pacific? And both have like, you know, fantastic service, fantastic people. Lately, it, for me, Singapore is edging Cathay's just so slightly. Yeah. As in the crew is a bit more empathic. I mean, they're both empathic. I mean, again, we're talking about five-star airlines we're talking about like really like top of the crop airlines but it seems to me that and especially that crew was absolutely fantastic guys that crew was not only professional and there and you know but it was also i don't know it was not only smiling we could feel they were friendly i don't know there was something about it yeah i haven't experienced singapore long haul in a quite a long time and of course back then when we're talking like five years ago it was exemplary i flew them short haul singapore hong kong about 18 months ago and it was slightly disappointing but i think that oh, was see? just an anomaly i've flown cathay a lot recently and yeah it's it's good but you can start to see the cracks in the experience uh not so much on the ground because they've really upped their game there it's going to be interesting to me to see how they navigate this what is a very, very difficult time for them. Singapore Airlines seem to have, have dealt with that about four years ago, but Cathay are now in the eye of the storm and, and they, they need to do some a lot of work to, to kind of regain that footing as, without question, one of the best airlines in the world. Two tidbits about that flight because the 380 in business class have done it. It was not a 777, a new one, but it, it's a great, again, nothing really... I'm sorry because I'm sure some of our listeners will say Paul is like, oh, it's usual to be flying in business class with Singapore. I'm not. I know it's not usual, but I'm saying it was, as I was expecting, very, very good. Two things that was interesting, uh, and I noticed that when I already took Singapore last uh, two months ago, uh, they do not, and I ask actually a flight attendant, they do not offer the pouches, you know, the amenity kit from any flight outside of Singapore coming in. They only offer them now from Singapore coming out, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. That I mean, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. I honestly thought the first time I did, uh, it happened to me, again, a month and a half ago, that they forgot. my. And I said, you know what? Because to be very frank with you, I like seeing a minute tickets. Me but too. I don't, I, I don't really use them. So I, I would totally be okay that airlines shift to a model when it's either on demand or when you simply have a lot of stuff available to you in the lavatory. Because I, it's a big cost. I understand we pay a lot of money for business class. But honestly, besides collecting them, <laughs> I, never, I don't yeah. really use them a lot. But the thing is, having this kind of policy when they say 
on it, it doesn't it's not about the time because i got you know singapore airlines amenity kit on business class for two and a half hours within asia but coming from zurich or from london to singapore didn't have them that strikes me a bit of odd policy it does and i think if it's more of a uh, you know on demand actually isn't a bad idea but also if it's you know, a day flight that's three hours regionally. Yeah, of course you're not going to. That doesn't make any sense. But long but they do. haul, yeah. <laughs> see, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to use it. If if but if it's an overnight from to London to Singapore, absolutely, I need. Yeah. I need at the very least the eye mask and the earplugs. Well, I always have my eye mask. I always use the one we talked about it a few episodes ago about the one that is a uh, first class uh, Emirates. The one that is uh, the business class cafe is also very good. These are my favorite and I always have one with me anyway uh, because I don't like these little elastics that, you know, I go into your yeah. ears and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky. So I, since I flew a, a few times Singapore lately, they currently have amenity kits made for the 70 years of the airline. The pouches are really nice, made of leather. Uh, I'm going to use them for other purposes. I'm going to put actually my electronics in them now. from now on. There's two colors. One is black, one is white. Guys, if you fly them, try to collect them. They're actually uh, very, very nice. Is there one item in an amenity kit that struck you as genius that you've never had seen anywhere else that you've seen in one airline that caught your eye? I, don't, I wouldn't ever. necessarily, it was genius, but it did make me go, holy cow, was the the set, not just one, but the set of three Bulgari aftershaves <laughs> on, yeah, uh, on Emirates. Emirates in business class. It was, <laughs> uh, it was very impressive. Oh, and also the... The pajamas, which I guess is slightly outside of the amenity kit on Cathay and First, was done uh, in a typical Hong Kong style from a, uh, a boutique uh, brand in, uh, in in Hong Kong. I thought that was cool. But the, yeah, the Bulgari stuff, I was like, wow, this is pretty pretty baller. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll invite uh, Johnny from The Designer. We'll dedicate an entire episode talking about amenity kits and pajamas because I also have like a collection of pajamas that, 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 that I can... Usually it's in, in, in first, obviously. So yeah. every time I just keep them, I don't fly in first enough to have like a, a full collection, but I have some qu- interesting one. Uh, the reason I've asked you the question is, and I forgot to mention when we talked about Korean Air. It's ah. a silly thing, but they have... One, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not as plush and baller, like you said, from for Emirates. But there's one item that I really enjoy. They have a little cream that you put under your eyes so that your oh, eyes look yeah. less puffy. Where did I have I, that? I can't remember what airline I had that on. It gets kind of tingly stuff. I know exactly what you're talking uh, about. <laughs> uh, you know what? It's, that's the best thing to look refreshed after a long haul flight. I was like, I'm never going to use most of the stuff that they have. The aftershave, I don't use it. Well, but this, it's a little bottle and you just put it under your eyes and the, clearly, I mean, I, I know it's just cosmetics, guys, but it actually worked and I found it that it was very to the point of flying long haul. Yeah, very, very (laughs) nice. Little thing, it's a little thing. Uh, Yeah, very odd thing. Uh, I was at Zurich Airport taking the Singapore Airline flight, and I was looking at the board, and there were two gates announced for my flight in rotation, and it was like, what on earth is this? Yeah, and I was really confused. I'm like, where am I supposed to go? Until... I went to the actual door and I realized that the two doors are one on top of the other. So depending if you're the upper deck or the lower deck, you have a different door number. That's interesting. That's weird. (laughs) That's very weird, right? It's very confusing when you see that on the board because you're like, oh my God, they don't know which gate it is. The plane keeps moving from one gate to another, like an airplane, you know? (laughs) So no, actually, no, it's just just that. Anyway, just a little quirk. I love the E-Gates in Zurich. People know my love from Zurich Airport. They have opened a new senator lounge. Uh, It's fantastic. And... Alex, you have to go, not by definition, to that lounge, of course, but to the E-Gate in Zurich because you have a view of the three runways. So you see Ah. both landings and departures. You see the entire other bit of the airport. And you have a huge, it's a a block, uh, so it's a square, a rectangle. And you have a terrace on both sides. And you can Uh. go out and watch as long as you want. And it's fantastic. Perfect. Honestly, it's absolutely Absolutely perfect. You can see, and you see, you know, three eighties, triple sevens, Avros. You see, I know, I know, you haven't flown the Avro because Swiss just retired its Avro. So you see a lot of great things. Anyway, I remember when I said, "There's one thing I don't like about Singapore Airport." You said, "I know what it is," and I answered, "Well, the carpet." carpet. You didn't expect. I didn't expect that. I still find the carpet like it's lousy. But what was the thing that you thought that I didn't like at the airport? Security at the gate. Exactly. So that's exactly what I wanted to talk about for like a few minutes. <laughs> 
Amsterdam has that as well. What do you think about security at the gate versus security at the beginning of the terminal? I don't like security at the gate. I'd rather just get it over and done with and enjoy the airport because you then have to... I mean, Singapore, I've got it down to an art and it actually doesn't take that long. But if you get into the airport, you you go and grab a bottle of you know water or something and then you forget that you've got security at the gate. It just It just seems like one of those things that... You want to put it at the back of your mind as soon as you've you you know you've gone through you've you've you can go through security and then enjoy your airport experience depending on the airport. But I just it just I don't not get like it at all. It throws <laughs> off my rhythm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I was like, where's security? Why am I not seeing like a security point after immigration? What's yeah. going on here? But actually, you know, so I thought I thought a long time about it because like you, it was like this throws me off. But at the same time, I realized that, of course, I still prefer having one set of security that's it. Because my thinking was like, if I, I don't know when I'm supposed to go to the gate, will I miss security? But I think there's no way. If the gate is open, security at the gate is open. They're not going to close security at the gate and you being able to see people inside going to the plane and you being stuck outside. So at the end of the day, does that really change something? I'm not sure. I still prefer a single set of security, but I'm not sure that they... Maybe, guys, if you've ever experienced that when you've been blocked to, from entering the gate at that security point, whether Amsterdam or Singapore or any other airports in the world that do that, let us know. But I don't think they will ever prevent you from going there, yeah. right? But you still have to queue, and that's the thing I don't like. It can take a while, and it can it throws off your timings for when you go to the or would ordinarily go to the gate. And as you say, once you're in, getting out to go do something is difficult because, of course, once you go through security, there's no amenities. So, yeah, I just don't. I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah, I see no. why they do it. I just don't like it. Guys, let us know if you prefer that. I'm also like Alex. I vote for Alex for president of all airports in the world. Remove, please, <laughs> the security in every single gate, please. So Singapore to Manila was interesting because I took another 777 and it was yet another business class. So I've experienced four different business classes now on, 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 wow. on, on actually. It was a 2002 aircraft. Wow. Uh, it's, so yeah, so they have, it's, it's, there are different sets. The one I had mentioned in the previous episodes was uh, the old, old one was there was no separation between, there was a 232 two, two, two maybe, and there was no separation between seats. This one is like an evolution of that where there's actually, it's a bit like a 777 uh, Emirates business class. So you, you have some privacy with your fellow passenger. The planes was, was half empty anyway, so I had all the seats for me. But interesting to see that Singapore is concurrently running so many products i never realized that for me singapore was this like big massive seat that you find in the 380 but actually they have a lot of different uh different products uh manila i'll go there in a minute way back uh, I, I was looking to again fly the 350 from cathay pacific amazing as always it's yeah. a fantastic plane and a fantastic airline so of course transiting in in in, in hong kong absolutely superb the transfer areas are very easy to find and very easy to clear security there they're very nice but then the big one was for me to fly to 777 er uh from swiss i was so looking forward to it in business class had a bulkhead seat i was like yeah this is so cool nice. a lot of stuff didn't go the way i expected first of all it's a little thing i really don't care because i don't really need you know, to being recognized as a valued customer. I don't really care, to be honest, because when you're already in business class, you're recognized anyway, let's be honest with that. Uh, but, you know, I saw that the maître de cabine, they call it in Swiss, was mm. going and talking to passengers. And I was like, hmm, I'm gold, so senator, and he's not talking to me. So out of curiosity, I say, uh, excuse me, sir, when he was finished, finished with his round, I said, excuse me, sir, can you just let me know, um, how are my miles on the on the flight? And he, has, he had a manifest, he says, no. So it's very strange because I had booked my flight on Swiss.com and I realized that not a single of my flights have been recognized besides the London uh, Zurich oh, no. one, which, and actually it, it was even worse because the, the person uh, at <laughs> at Manila Airport, out of courtesy, because I, fly, I was flying Cathay Pacific, did put my One World BA miles on every single leg going back. So guys, in a few weeks, I'll be able to tell you did I gain double miles on two programs or what exactly happened? I'm this will be interesting to see. 
no idea what's gonna happen to be honest anyway they apologized they offered me a box of chocolate to apologize i didn't guys i don't really i really i was apologetic myself because like i was really curious as an av geek to know what happened yeah, i yeah. don't i was not like complaining but they still came with a box of chocolate and uh, that was fantastic chocolate by the way guys of, of course, course swiss swiss <laughs> right but still and really like high quality chocolate that are pretty expensive so and i know they have a few boxes in flights to do that one thing that didn't work for me on this flight is not that is the seat so life flight really seat, yeah i don't know why life flight seat there's room it's fine there's a shit ton sorry for my french of storage you can put stuff pretty much anywhere around oh, you nice. it's one of these solo seats right uh which again for some strange reasons i was supposed to pay for because we makes you pay for solo seats versus, you know, 2-2. But never ask me when I booked. And the manifest also said unpaid for. And the guy said, yeah, don't worry, it's fine. But I was like, it's very strange what happened on with the Vanna Fly. Anyway, huh. the solo seat, you know how when the seat actually goes into a full flat position? Yeah. So, you know, it goes slightly forward. And where you sit, the seat actually goes forward. And the, the backrest actually goes completely flat. And depending on the airline, I'm sorry to talk in those terms, your butt goes either on the backrest if it's long enough or stays on the seat, etc., etc. For some reason, the seat, when in lifelike position, the seat of the seat is slightly lower than the backrest on a, a, a full life flight, which means it's almost like a step, you know, like a few centimeters. That's impossible. You, you have like something stuck in the just above your butt, you know, like in the, in the lower back. I don't know. I had to steal a few cushions to, to make it work. I don't know what's going on here. Who Who is the seat manufacturer? Do you know? I don't know. I don't... But is it also not uh, Zodiac? I I don't know. They check. seem Maybe to make it's... everybody's seats these days, but that's <laughs> annoying. And it's it's one of those things that once you get in your head, you can't unfeel the discomfort. Like, you can't <laughs> exactly. go... Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's that's disappointing to hear because I had uh, such high expectations of uh, that probably, seat. Probably if someone is, 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 is smaller than me maybe you know they can adapt and actually have their butt basically on the back you know the backrest of the seat when it's in full life flights that actually do you don't feel that but for me there's no way my head is actually hitting at some point you know the the end of the 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 the, the cocoon there for the seats it was really bizarre uh being too swiss and too british i didn't even come i didn't even ask it was like oh, already i already made them hell with my miles i don't want to receive it yet another box of chocolate so i just like did make do with with cushions but that's very disappointing guys who had flown this aircraft on swiss tell me was it something that you also saw or is it yeah. really only me because uh, maybe my seat was broken maybe the bulk seats are different but it was really not great. I still slept. Come on, let's not exaggerate. But it was a bit bizarre. Anyway, That's frustrating. more more stories next time because we need absolutely to get to the airport. Uh, I'll tell you more stories about all this next time. Sorry, I spoke a lot. Uh, there's also, we received a lot of reviews and fan mails. Guys, we haven't forgotten you. I promise you that uh, we will give you the shout outs that you deserve because we received one fan mail. You remember, Annex from Matt uh, that sent us this huge email about he wanted to thank us for the podcast that yes was, that was pretty that's so amazing cool. so matt will we will you know give you a proper shout out in, in yeah. one of the follow-up episodes as of the all the uh, we received a lot of itunes reviews that are really really cool. really kind yeah really, really kind and, and i will address them next time so manila is a very very strange airport manila has Three terminals. And, you know, like most of the airports that were built in Southeast Asia, it used to be like a military base, right? And the military base was transformed into an airport. It happened so many times. And yeah. actually not only in Southeast Asia, in a lot of places around the world, right? Actually, if you live in Manila, in Makati, the the road is next to Ayala is the, the old airport. And that was the road. And the new airport is another, yet another uh, base. So it has three terminals, four it's complicated. Terminal 1 was the terminal that was built uh, to be the, the all-encompassing terminal, basically, at the beginning. My God. This is probably one of the worst terminals I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Uh, first of all, of course, it was built for probably a capacity of 5 million people. When I was living there, there were probably 30 million that was <laughs> going through that terminal. So that just tells you to the point that airlines like first i think lufthansa did that i think swiss did that a few americans airlines did that they simply stopped flying to manila 
This is unacceptable. <gasps> wow. We cannot work with that terminal. They simply stopped. I rem- remember meeting the head of uh, the Lufthansa group living in Manila. And I was saying, what are you doing here? You don't have any flights coming there anymore. It's like, yeah, we're hoping to make sense out of them so that they do something about it <laughs> so Jeez. that we can fly there anymore. So it's really, really, really bad. We're talking 2009. It was, when it was raining, it was actually raining in the terminal as well. I mean, you'd have to kind of do some kind of go through a maze of avoiding, you know, drops of water coming from oh the ceiling God. inside of the terminal. The, the lounges were super bad. Uh, I experienced a few lounges because I even like at some point in my life also like connected there with Etihad. It was, it was a disaster. So honestly, the first image you got out of the country was like, my God, what's going on? Ugh. The other terminal back then that existed as well, that still exists, and I'll go back to Terminal 1, was Terminal 2, which was built only for Philippine Airlines. Uh, so you have to fly Philippine Airlines, either domestic or international, to get to that terminal. It's better. It's airy, but it also has reached its capacities. Much, much newer, uh, thank God. Uh, it's okay. I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna criticize it too much, but you could feel that it had also kind of reached its capacity number of people. Uh, I think I've read somewhere that when an airport reached 85% of capacity, that's when people start to feel it's too cramped. Ah, that's so of course, Yeah, so of course, when you're already like, like, let's say, 120, of course, it just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So it was always a bit cramped. It was it was okay. They call it the Centennial uh, Terminal. Why? Because it was opened at, I think, the 100th years of the independence from the Philippines. Uh. Okay, okay, Terminal. If you fly, ever fly Philippines Airlines, I've, I've done it a lot. It's it's okay. Uh, terminal 4, there's a reason I'm going to not go to Terminal 3 yet, is a domestic. Uh, it's not actually called Terminal 4. I mean, I've seen both. both. Some people call it Terminal 4. Some people call it domestic. It's basically a hangar uh, when you can basically have maybe 200 people in it. There's no seating and nothing. So it's probably the worst thing I've ever seen. Again, it's to fly very small airlines, domestic low-cost airlines. Uh, They will revamp it someday, but it's still not done. I used to fly an airline, and now I think other is dead has been acquired, which was called Zest. It was acquired by Air Asia, called Air Asia Zest. But I think they were shut down because, of course, they were not maintaining the planes properly. They were, they were like, they were really like, okay. This one, when I had this flight, when I was supposed to fly to one airport and it actually flew to another one, that was the kind of the state of the airline. So it was a bit, a bit strange. But anyway, so we're also very dire. Terminal 3 has a history. Why? Because they realized they're not stupid. They realized that they needed to kind of build another terminal. When I was living there in 2009, I could see another terminal, which was Terminal 3. I could see it. It looked brand new and it was just there. The thing is, is that they, of course, outsourced the work to uh, European mm. companies. I think it was Fraport, it was Frankfurt, <laughs> our beloved Frankfurt that yeah. built it. But when it was ready, because the Philippines is the Philippines, I'm sorry to my Filipino friends, but sometimes it just seems that it's... <sighs> yeah. they, the, the, the president decided that uh, the agreement was illegal and they basically took it away from the guys without actually paying for the work. Then, of course, uh, that went into ar- arbitration, both oh, in Singapore no. and in the US. Make the story short, the, the, this terminal stayed closed for about six, seven years. It was brand new. Started actually falling apart. There was part of the ceiling that actually fell. <laughs> then they had a settlement at some point was made and they started to open it slowly. Again, when I was living there, I was seeing it brand new. So currently it's the main international terminal, thank God, and not Terminal 1 anymore. The problem is that, yeah, they fixed it a little bit after the ceiling had fallen and they had to kind of find money. The problem is, imagine the terminal that was there, but unused for almost 10 years and now is open. It's already outdated to a certain extent. Wow. And it looks not in shape. It's okay to be honest but you remember at the top of the show guys i was talking about incheon i was talking about these mega airports these mega hubs are being built this is not the case it's okay to be honest with you guys it's okay i'm not gonna this compare to what i used to experience in the philippines but ah it could be so much better yeah that's the, the layout you know the philippines used to be the richest country in the 50s in southeast asia it looks like everybody else kind of took off and the philippines is is it's amazing. As I said earlier, I think in another episode, they've built their like skyscrapers everywhere. So the economy is strong, but that infrastructure bit is still not there. I mean, it's it's okay. 
don't be turned off, go to the Philippines. This terminal is okay, but it's a bit bizarre. Now to the actual terminal experience, it's pretty fun. It's one of these terminals, you know, Alex, that you have a first security to go through simply to enter the terminal. Yeah, like Istanbul and a few of those other places. You have on your, when you see the terminal on your right side, you have a firearm deposit box. <laughs> yeah, you have someone to connect you, which is always kind of stuff. Why not go, hmm, I'm going to put my Glock there and then enter the terminal. <laughs> I do not condone bribing, right? But you will have always people coming to you, especially if you're dressed well, and to say, I can fast track you. And obviously, they're airports employees. And obviously, you pay them something, maybe two, three dollars. And you bypass the queue of security. You still have to go through that first bit of security. But you can bypass the queue because depending on sometimes, the queues are actually pretty long. That security yeah. is not great, as in. I forgot my belt. I forgot a lot of things on me that didn't set the alarm off. So I'm not really sure. I mean, they, of course, scan your luggages, but I'm not sure how efficient that is. Then the rest of the experience is what do you expect? It works. There's no fast track, but that's okay. The gates are nothing to write home about. It kind of works. It's really bizarre because it feels like as if it should have been a new terminal, but it looks like it was made 15 years ago. So there's kind of a disconnect in the experience. But honestly, compared to what it used to be, it works. I haven't been back to Terminal 1. Apparently, it has seen a refurbishment. So it's not as dire as it used to be. I think a few airlines still go there. You might be there. It's okay. The one thing I will give you as a tip, as an advice, there's two that are important. Never connect there unless you know it's the same terminal. Why? There's no way to connect between terminals. You have to go out. So clear immigration, which takes forever. And then you have to take a taxi or a jeepney and connect. It can take you up to four hours to go from one terminal Jeez. to another. <laughs> so never plan of saying, oh, I'm going to land in Manila, switch to another terminal to take a domestic airline, and I just need 45 minutes. That doesn't happen. No. That doesn't happen. You have to go out. And my second tip is that immigration is a bit of a mess. Imagine you playing Tetris you know what Tetris is, right? So you see all the cues. So basically you see, because everybody plays that game, you know, you say, okay, this line is going to open. So I'm going to switch to this line. Then I'm going to like roll over to the other line. And then I'm going to under the other line. It always feels to me that I'm, I'm a bit of Tetris myself, you know, one of the blocks. And I'm going right. between lines, swinging and swiveling until I'm in front of an officer. <laughs> it actually works. You're the, not the selling me on this airport, Paul. You really <laughs> <No>. aren't. <laughs> The, the uptick is that the Philippines is an amazing country. It's wonderful. The beaches are probably the best in the world. The people are so nice. So that's the thing that works. You know, I said everything about here about the bad infrastructure bit of the airport. But the people, whether it's security officers, whether it's checking counter people, whether it's... They are just so nice at every step. So, you know, it's like this thing where... Maybe, oh my God, why am I waiting so long to get past uh, immigration? And then the immigration officer is so nice that you're like, oh, well, you know, that, yeah, that's hard to, actually. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. hard to... yeah, yeah, it just works. So guys, please go to the Philippines because it has really amazing, amazing beaches and locations. Manila is an acquired taste, to be frankly honest. I love it but because I used to live there. But the rest of the Philippines is Fully, fully fantastic. You have to go visit. The airport will see, and I'll finish with that, the airport will see at uh, some point some upgrade. But the big debate now is whether they want to keep the airport where it is, which is slightly southwest uh, of uh, the center of Manila. But again, Manila, you know what? It's a denser city in the world. It's denser in terms of population than Hong Kong, right? There's 23, wow. I think 33,000 people per kilometer square or something. It's really super dense. So they cannot really grow the airport anymore there. So there's either they keep it there, which is very cool because even there's a lot of traffic in Manila, there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of these Southeast Asian cities. It's kind of close enough to the city that you don't feel that you have to wait forever. Yeah. But they're thinking to build a new international airport at Clark. It already exists. Emirates already flies there along with others. But that's currently three hours away from the center of Manila in the north. And uh, so, of course, they promise you a high-speed train and everything, but knowing how they do these uh, infrastructure projects in the Philippines, I really hope they keep uh, MNL, Manila Airport, where it is, at least for the moment, because I don't want to do, like, 
three and a half hours in cars to go to the city uh, from uh, Clark yeah, Airport. It. Yeah, fond memories. Alex is used to these airports. You know, it's emerging country airports. It's not perfect, but there's so much to love about them, even though they don't work. You know, you get furious and then you're like, haha, it's still fun, actually, because it's an experience. The one thing, Alex, one day you'll go there that is the most striking, possibly, is that since nobody can, of course, enter the terminal unless you're ticketed, Everybody has to wait outside, you know, when you arrive. So if you have a driver waiting for you, a family waiting for you, friends waiting for you, Paul waiting for you, Alex, there, you know, <laughs> when you'll do your attaché show in Manila, it's a swarm of thousands of yeah. people wavering. And that's both overwhelming, but at the same time, it's super welcoming. It's like this kind of, you're like, oh, wow. I used to feel home, obviously, every time I was flying back there when I was living there. And I was seeing this swarm of people. Of course, it was messy. It was super hot and humid and whatever. But I was like, God, I'm home. It's so cool. So one day, Alex, I promise you, I'll welcome you to Manila to do one I'd of love your Attaché episodes. By the way, guys, watch the LA episode of Attaché. Some people say it's the best one. I almost agree. I still think Tokyo is the best one. But you know what they have in common, Alex? And I want to... Congratulate you for that direction you're going. They have a lot of both these episodes and probably Beirut as well. have a lot of emotions in there. There's something, I mean, of course, it's still a travel show. It still tells you what to do and how to get from the airport. I mean, the views of the airport is a bastard. I mean, your helicopter was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. But, there, but there's something really, I don't know, that connects with me with these episodes. So congrats. It was amazing thank you. show. That's, those are the ones that I enjoy doing the most as well. So no, I, thank you. I appreciate that. So keep keep doing those. And I, because I think actually people appreciate them. It's, that makes you very, very different. And guys, watch. Even if you're just an AV geek and you don't care about anything travel and anything food. Because as you know, Alex, there's a lot of food in what he talks about. <laughs> the, the, actual, the actual sites of LA Hanks. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's so definitely lucky. worth doing if you're ever in LA. Those guys, light flight helicopters were just... Just top drawer. And guys, thank you. Sorry I spoke again a lot in this episode. Now I will have less stories to tell about my travels. It's going to be Alex Stern because he will be traveling all around. And I hope not only with BA. Uh, and we'll have a surprise for the uh, next episode. Yeah, this is be a good episode one. 60, episode 60. Uh, guys, happy travels. Safe travels, guys. <laughs>